Okay, I guess I probably could have described these contract systems a little bit better in my last video. It would seem I need to clarify a little bit on purchase power agreements and capacity remuneration mechanisms. Luckily, one of you were kind enough to come and chat with me the other day. He gave me some really good insight onto purchase power agreements. But before we get into that, let's go over some real life examples. Purchase power agreements are relatively easy to understand though. Basically, a company will contract a renewable energy provider and purchase that power at a set price. This can be for five years to 15 years or more. I'm in Alberta, so we're gonna do the Berta bias today. This is the Traverse Solar Project located between Calgary and Lethbridge. It was built between 2020 and Q4 of 2022 with an expected lifespan of about 35 years and an installed power of 465 megawatts on about 13.5 square kilometers. Using a 20% capacity factor, that could approximately power 81,000 households. For reference, there's about 500,000 households in Calgary, and it's 825 square kilometers. So just to put it into perspective, our cities take up way more space than renewables ever will, solar being the most space intensive. Overall, the site costs about $700 million or $1,500 per kilowatt CAD. And then when you convert that into USD, it's about $1,130 per kilowatt, which is right in line with the Lazard studies. What's interesting about the site is part of the PPA program that Amazon has been doing to ensure their operations are renewable. I don't know the exact specifics on the cost of the power, but Amazon is going to take 400 megawatts of the farm's output meaning that the energy almost all of the time will be accounted for through the PPA. PPAs can be contracted at any level, from a government, to a business, to a person. Now let's quickly go over a couple more examples. The Total Energies project in South Africa is being built with 216 megawatts of solar and a 500 megawatt hour battery. 75 megawatts of that is gonna be PPA. So in this case, you only get a portion of the power being accounted for while the rest would go to the open market kind of a hybrid system contract, and there are a bunch more PPA contracts that are going up all over South Africa for solar, wind, and hydro connected to the South African government. Here's a chart of all the PPA contracts and their prices for wind in the US, but it's not all roses. We've seen PPA prices climb over the last few years due to increased demands, market uncertainties, and high interest rates. As there's more demand for renewables and companies are willing to pay a premium to show that their power is from renewables, our only option is really to build, build, build. Much like the housing market, if the demand is there, but the supply is low, prices will go up. PPAs are driving investment into this sector and making renewables more profitable. Even with the increase of costs since 2020, PPAs are still competitive with fossil fuels at five to seven cents per kilowatt hour. But this really gets into that conversation that I had with one of you. He mentioned that PPAs for the actual companies contracting them can be a short-term sacrifice for project funding. And that as we deplete these low-hanging fruits as they were, these PPA contracts may become less and less desirable because obviously the best places are getting filled up. One of the biggest issues that we talked about was energy traffic jams, where if you're building all of these renewables in the best places, you have to still get that energy out. It's kind of an argument for long line transmission, but that increased costs. And then whose burden is it to bear those costs? Is it government or is it private companies? This can cause some nodal concerns. And obviously this can drive up costs if it's not planned accordingly. I bang the drum of long line transmission, but obviously it's quite difficult to build. No one's saying it's easy to build these lines across the entire country and negotiate these contracts with different indigenous groups and different communities and different states and all of these things. There's obviously issues with it. I thought the conversation with this guy was really, really good. Unfortunately, I fucked up the audio. Regardless, I hope this clears up some of the confusion in the last video. These contracts have been happening for decades, but it's important that we utilize them adequately and in the right places to finance these renewable projects. Obviously, this doesn't fully deal with the renewable intermittency issues, which I'm now going to talk about in detail about capacity remuneration mechanisms and how they complement PPAs and renewables. The basic principle of CRMs is that you pay a premium to an energy supplier that can meet the variability in demands. This is dominated by coal and natural gas plants, and now batteries and transmission are being included here. This is usually done with either power or energy guarantees. Capacity remuneration mechanisms are much more complicated than PPAs. I think this is where most of the confusion came in the last video, because I simplified the results and showed static values. But as we saw with the PPAs, sometimes only a portion of the energy is static, while the rest can fluctuate. CRMs are much the same. It may only apply in a certain circumstance, or it could be variable on the amount of energy that's required, etc. There's more variability on how these contracts can be structured. For example, the typical types of CRMs are as follows. Centralized forward capacity auctions, where operators compete in energy auctions prior to delivering the energy contracts that may last for months or years. Centralized reliability options are similar to the forward auctions with provisions for times of scarcity. Typically, these commitments are upwards of four years. Capacity obligations, these are decentralized forward capacity auctions where the energy retailers decide how much capacity they need and go out to the market to ensure that there's enough energy during peak times. Then the operators are obliged to meet that demand for the client's peak times. France is an example of this. Capacity payments, 
a way to top up the costs incurred by the energy providers to provide the energy capacity for these peaks. Then we have strategic reserves. Rather than being market-wide, it's a capacity payment for a targeted emergency situation. You can also mix and match these different systems. So to give you an example, let's look at Ireland's CRMs. These contracts that I'm showing are from 2024 and 2025, but many European countries use CRMs. CRMs are measured in megawatts, so a company will commit a number of megawatts of power that they can provide at any time. This contract was negotiated in 2021, and they had 130 energy providers compete in the auction and 14 developing projects. The set clearing price was 47,000 euros per megawatt. The average price on the bid was actually 51,000 euros per megawatt, that difference more or less being the premium. Overall, over 6,100 megawatts of energy was pledged to be available to meet the demand. Here we can see the total energy pledged by breakdown. Unsurprisingly, gas turbines are highly represented. Here the derated capacity is including the capacity factors. Around 1% of the country's installed wind even made it onto the auction. Since these auctions are done in advance, developing projects can also get in on the bidding. You can see how this type of system still leverages capitalist markets as long as there's enough competition. Rather than bidding data today, you do one bid and commit to providing that power. This reminds me a lot of how countries like Canada could bring down the cost of pharmaceuticals by using similar mechanisms, going out to the market and bulk purchasing these items to bring down the overall costs. Sorry, America. Obviously, if you don't have many energy suppliers, even a CRM would fail to bring down prices, as monopolies are bad. Just ask any Canadian about their phone plan. A big thumbs up to Saskatchewan for having Sastel to actually bring market competition to their province. This is also why companies like Comcast lobby against allowing cities to create their own internet infrastructure so they can maintain their monopoly. Like I said in the last video, at minimum, it should be a government's job to negate the negative consequences of monopolies. So fuck Comcast, fuck Bell, fuck Rogers, and fuck TELUS. And fuck the Trudeau government for allowing Shaw to be purchased by Rogers. We have antitrust policies. They need to be implemented and utilized. Anyway, sorry for the aside and back to CRMs. You can see that for a country like Ireland, which has to import much of their energy in the form of fuel, natural gas, that having a CRM system can encourage deployment of energy systems on the island. More wind means more value for these battery systems. And soon the Celtic interconnector will be completed between Ireland and France, providing 700 megawatts of power potential or upwards of 20% of the island's power needs, along with giving them an offload point for their renewable overcapacity. But there's still considerations we have to think about with CRMs, and they're not perfect. One of the biggest concerns with CRMs is that they lack transparency. Some advocates suggest that they should be more customer-focused, real-time energy price valuing on specific energy reserves being used, i.e., where is your energy coming from at any time, and how much does it actually cost? helping to provide some level of confidence in the energy volatility that we see. This table outlines kind of the important factors that we're looking for in a good CRM system, where there's scarcity incentives, economic volume capacity, balancing of risk, demand flexibility, cross-border resources, and ensuring there's a level playing field. Capacity markets can lead to weak market incentives or penalties for non-performance. This can be mitigated by pre-qualification and disallowing certain early stage projects from participating in the auctions, and also enforcing or increasing the penalties for non-compliance. Though in the long run, that would just get priced into the market if it's done properly. This was actually an issue in the Irish case, where some of these early stage projects weren't completed in time or weren't completed at all, so they weren't actually able to meet the capacity demands that they had asked for back in 2021. Capacity markets tend to also be prone to overcapacity. This is in part due to the timeframes that are actually incurred three to four years in advance, and in part because they're essentially regulated, where larger institutions are going to bias excess capacity. Though the mitigations here are largely administrative, we need to scrutinize the estimates and make sure that they're not overly conservative. Decentralization can help as communities closer to their issues can better estimate their needs rather than have a top-down approach. Think city by city instead of state by state. It can also be mitigated by having shorter contract times. The next issue we look at is reserve scarcity pricing. This can cause higher prices as operators will bid higher if they fear that some level of government interference is going to occur or if the bidding years are far enough out and those carry a lot of risk. This is mitigated by shifting towards reserve markets in real time, forward contracts ensuring set pricing with shorter time windows, and policies that discourage the government interference when prices are high, but allowing provisions for consumers like price caps that are known from the beginning, rather than direct government involvement to minimize market interference. Capacity market incentives can also be misaligned with the consumers. Essentially that if I as the consumer reduce my demand during peak times of scarcity, I'm not rewarded. This can be mitigated by adding additional charges to peak times or rebates for reducing energy consumption during these times, resulting in what's called a demand-side response. Smart meters are required for this though, which for some reason is like a conspiracy theory, but Fuck me. Then we need to look at cross-border competition. Centralized CRMs can have trouble creating a level playing field. To combat this, Europe is using what's called the margin available for cross-zonal electricity trade. That requires at least 70% of interconnected capacity to be available to the market. 
or in normal terms, it's just a copper plate as I've described in my previous videos. But it just ensures that you have long line transmission energy to dampen local renewable droughts and that everything's playing on a fair market. Check out these two videos for more info on these topics. Capacity markets can also incentivize high carbon systems. As these contracts can last for many years, it inevitably biases existing technology over newer developments. The biggest mitigation strategy here is that transparent and increasing carbon prices helps a lot, as dirtier tech will in the long term lose to cleaner tech. This is one of the uncertainties with Polyev's rhetoric here in Canada. He wants to axe the tax. So fossil fuel companies can, in a sense, price that probability into their decarbonization strategy. Though, as I've explained in other videos, his technology over taxes is actually more expensive and less efficient than the carbon tax. That might just mean that he doesn't even do anything. The other solution, obviously, is limiting CRM times, say a max of one year as that seems to mitigate a lot of the problems that I've described here. Overall, I just want markets to work efficiently and provide the best services for us, the customers. PPAs or CRMs are not I win buttons, but rather tools to help transition energy systems. The CRM checklist can be used to mitigate some of those concerns with CRMs that I've discussed, and I'll link the reference page I use for a lot of this information if you'd like to learn more. I'm getting some great engagement with y'all, and that's awesome. I spoke with someone who has experience in this field, as I mentioned before. If you have knowledge on any of these topics that I've covered or want to chat about something remotely related to the content I put out, my Discord and subreddit are always open for you. And the streaming on Tuesday night should start soon, if it hasn't already. Come chat with me. Call me a liberal shill. Tell me where I fucked up anything. Anyway, thanks for listening. As always, the references are down in the description below. Thanks.